Hi. It's very nice to be with you. I thought the first thing I'd say, do you think this might be the future of food? Vitamin, nutritionally sound pills. It seems to me very unlikely. One future I feel safe about is the future of food and cooking. So I think my title of the talk is Food, an Anthology of Revenge, which is a, in reference to David Sachs' bestseller. And what he's saying in his bestseller is that as we advance further and further towards the digital age, what happens, in fact, to us is that we fall rather in love with analog things. He talks about how vinyls are beating streaming of music. He talks about how film photography has come back in. He talks about, at schools, what he says, we should have a lot of interactive teaching. And he doesn't have a chapter, which I think is rather surprising, on food, because food is the ultimate analog activity. So I think food is here to stay, and we should all fall in love with food. I think it's really important. The thing is that we should all cook together. Cooking together is such an important social way of life. I have my favorite day of the year, which is Christmas Day. And on Christmas Day, the reason it's favorite, not because I'm anticipating good presents, because my youngest daughter and I do the cooking. And we get into the kitchen, quite at a sensible time, and we prepare all the food. And her boyfriend noticed how we cook together, which is that we just cook in synchronization. I start something, she carries on, and she cooks well, and we don't have to talk about the cooking. So we have a mass of time to laugh and chat together, and we, the only cooking thing is endless tasting, particularly tasting of the gravy, which is, I think, the most important part of the roast dinner. And then we have, we look, we feel happy because we've cooked a marvelous meal, though I say it myself, and then even happier because when it's all over and there's that tremendous mess, we go and watch the television and the others do the washing up, which strikes me as the best part of living together. Anthropologists have said that if you cook and well together, you live well together and eat well together. And I think eating together is such a vital part of, of life. When we eat together at home and we sit around the dining room table, the kitchen table, that's when important discussions take place. That's when we really come to decisions about all sorts of different things. So I think sitting down and eating together is, is vitally important. Various things have slightly changed the way that we eat, I think. In the old days, it was intergenerational in that recipes would pass down through the families, and that's how people learned to cook. The advent of an awful lot of fast food and Deliveroo, I see it everywhere here, is wonderful and you can get fantastic food, but there's something that ties Deliveroo with watching the television and things like that. So I think that you lose the art of communal eating, which is my big argument. That's what we, I'm anticipating, not the pills, but going forward to carrying on with proper communal eating. That's what I think is so important. And you might say, well, you don't need to teach people to cook because they can watch the television. You can watch the television. You can get wonderful ideas on the television, but cooking, you can't get the answers always. If you're cooking away and your souffle doesn't seem to be rising well, there's nothing you can do, you think, because you can't say to the television chef, my souffle is not rising, because they can't hear you. If, on the other hand, your hollandaise sauce has begun to curdle, Again, you can't speak to the TV chef because they're not there. And I would tell you what to do immediately. You can either put a little tiny bit of ice or a tiny little bit, bit of boiling water and your hollandaise will restore itself. And similarly, the TV chef doesn't know how you interpret words. We had a boy at Leeds once and he did a very reasonable thing. He was told to separate his eggs, so he put two eggs on the left-hand side of the table and two eggs on the right-hand side of the table. You might laugh, but it, that's because you know something about cooking. But if you know absolutely nothing, so they don't know about the interpretation, unless one had a completely teaching channel. But it, I don't think cookery te on television will replace teaching, because with teaching, you have live and immediate feedback. And there's no sort of panic about it, because there's someone there to help you. 
I think also with the advent of fast food. There's nothing wrong with going to Pizza Express to have a delicious pizza before you go out to the cinema. But the trouble is that you don't really eat, talk that much. And what the real problem is that you are sort of a cog in the restaurant machine. We had a restaurant called Leith Soho, and it was a very good selling point. What we did was we put in bold at the bottom of the menu, if there's anything you'd like to eat that's not on the menu, if the ingredients are available, we'll make it for you. And what it did was it made the people at the table talk. It made the people at the table talk to the waiters. Sometimes the waiter would bring the chef out to discuss what the person wanted. And the best thing about it was they generally wanted something very cheap indeed. So it was viable, commercially viable as well. So it was a, a nice approach to that. I teach food here at Eton, which is almost my happiest morning or afternoon of the week. We t I teach boys how to cook useful things for life at university and useful things to impress people that they might want to impress in future years, not yet. <laughs> um, but we also teach boys, I also teach boys to cook for guests. So when we cook on a Thursday, we then have a guest to lunch and the guest is going to be impressed by their food. Whatever happens, they're going to be impressed because it's going to be good because they're such clever boys. And then if they've impressed people, then people will think, oh, I can cook. And half the thing is having belief. It's not rocket science to cook. You've got to know some skills and you've got to read the recipe, but you can do it. And anyone who's frightened of cooking shouldn't think that it's, there's anything particularly special about it. So, and, and I promise you that teaching cooking is the best thing in the world, so other people should go into it. In fact, this morning I was teaching, and I noticed, at least the boys noticed, that time was passing. And in that time that was passing, because I'm not aware of the time, nobody had access to an email, nobody had access to a telephone, until they wanted to take photographs of what they'd cooked. And so you were in a sort of completely ze separate zone and just happy. And there were sort of literary references to the importance of getting into that zone. If you remember in Anna Karenin, when Levin, who had endless anxieties going all around him, what he did was he went slightly to his servant's disgust and scythed in the fields. And a practical task, perfectly completed, I think is almost a sign of pure happiness, and cooking can definitely do that for you. But to do that, you do need to learn a few skills, and I was thinking about the skills. You, I would suggest that everybody needs a bit of knife skills, chopping made easy, but also I think what you need to know is understand a bit of the science of cooking, and things like learning about the role of eggs in cooking, you know what the yolks do, you know what the whites do, then you can cook things happily. And also, I think you should know about the structure of meat, because if you think where the piece of meat's come from, then you'd know how to cook it. That picture is a fillet steak, and you cook it for a very short of time, because the fillet is tucked right in underneath there, so it's a tender cut. If you were having an oxtail, and if you think of an oxtail flicking away all those flies, it moves and moves and moves, and it's a very tough cut of meat, but if you cook it very slowly, it will become incredibly tender. So I think knowing the cuts of meat is incredibly important. And so those are probably the skills you need. I hope I persuaded you you still need to learn to cook. If you need to learn to cook, will things change? And I think Things have changed so much and will continue to change. I don't know, not many of you were around cooking in the 70s when I started, but some of the food was disgusting. Um, salmon <laughs> came in a tin, <laughs> pink, very pink. Tuna fish, we didn't see fresh tuna fish, I don't think, till the 80s. You just didn't get it. Parmesan came in a tub. You never got fresh parmesan. It was ready grated and it smelt of vomit. I mean, there's no other word for it. It was really revolting. And also, we didn't have a sell-by dates, so you would leave that parmesan. I can remember my mother putting parmesan on spaghetti bolognese. It would have been delicious without the parmesan. And you, uh, Elizabeth David had introduced us to Mediterranean food, but 
if we wanted to use some olive oil, we went to the chemist and bought olive oil in a very small bottle, because that's the only olive oil that you could get. So recipe, uh, ingredients have changed, and ingredients are changing now. I'm not sure that that, um, that many West London foodies who haven't, somewhere in their cupboard, got perhaps some black rice, or some za'atar, or some sumac. And in their fridge, they've probably got uzu and miso paste and tamarind paste. Why have we got these exotic ingredients? Is because of cookery writers. I'm a cookery writer, but I'm a practical skills person. I'm not traveling around and finding new ingredients. But we had Elizabeth David first, who introduced us to Mediterranean food. And then we've moved on to Claudia Rodan, who introduced us to Middle Eastern food. And my sort of food hero is really Ottolenghi, who's just widened the introduction of all sorts of new foods and made many, many ingredients totally accessible. So he's my sort of hero. But, so I think that ingredients will continue to change, but what about the future of eating and life in general? I was thinking about the environment. I anticipate that we will be getting more and more organic. We, we have an organic farm in Somerset, a dairy farm, and not only is it good to have organic milk, but it also improves animal husbandry. I think that we will go more local, so food will become more local. If food becomes more local, I think it will become seasonal. And the other thing is that I think we will become more conscious of ethical food. I don't know how many of you know how foie gras is produced or what it is. I'm not going to ask you, but if you don't, look it up on the internet and then wonder in 20 years' time, will ethically unacceptable food still be eaten, I think, and hope not. I think we're also going to get much more interested in healthy eating. The Arguments and the discussions on healthy eating are quite complicated at the moment. When I brought my children up, I didn't let them eat butter. Now my daughter has children, and she doesn't let them eat sugar. But whatever we eventually find out we are meant to eat and how to eat, it's true that we've got to somehow lose weight. The HSC said that in 2015, 27% of Britain was obese, which is a frightening um, number. I think we'll also get, probably move our way towards vegetarian food. There are so many more vegetables available than there were, and we will be getting more and more vegetables. And I think it won't all be vegetarian. Meat will become an integral part rather than the principal part of many, many dishes. I think that cooking is a universal craft, and in this growing digital age, what we need is to maintain social activity. And at the heart of social activity is communal eating. And I think if you lose communal eating, you lose something that it is to be human. Whereas if you maintain social um, activity such as this, it is an important element in the continuation of socialization. I'll leave you with a nice picture of a chocolate fondant. Thank you very much.